the universe of wonders <laughs> surrounds yeah. us. Yeah. I think it's awe-inspiring, and we're just getting a tiny glimpse of that. Hey, Spike. Good to see you again. Welcome back to In Grace. Thanks for having me back. Hey, listen, uh, we had some fun, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, uh, just talking about the universe with you. It was a, a series that we just wanted to explore a little bit, the vastness and the beauty of our universe. And uh, you helped us understand all of that. So thank you for that. And good to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. And we really loved your, your video series, Creation Astronomy. Uh, and I understand there's another one coming out. Volume four. Okay. Hopefully next year. And what is That's that kind of cover? That's covering the issue of distant starlight. If the universe was created not that long ago, how is it that we can see all these objects that it would seem their light would need millions or billions of years to get here? Okay. So the Bible tells us that the universe is not that old, and but we still see these the light from vast distances. So how do we account for that? And you have an answer. Correct. Okay, good. Can't wait to uh, see there's, that. There's multiple answers, actually. Oh, okay. Well, I want to know your... Your best guess on that, but I'll watch the video. Okay, let me show you something that someone get gifted me, and I don't know that you've ever seen it. You probably have. You've seen about everything. Um, you ever seen anything like this? Huh. It's like a snow globe, but it's not. From what I understand, etched inside of this globe is the known universe. Ah. Uh-huh. And I can't really see me or you in there, but uh, obviously the Milky Way would be one of those you know little specks, but... Just the, the, when you start to think about how big the universe is, that's something that um, boggles the mind. I mean, literally, mm-hmm. you're, you're a man that you're an engineer and you've studied these things. It still probably boggles your mind, too. Oh, sure. I mean, we can assign numbers, but we can't understand what that really means on that scale. It's certainly beyond our normal experience. The thing that we wanted to talk about, the kind of the follow up since we filmed the James Webb Space Telescope has launched and has successfully got to position, unfurled, and has started to uh, show us some pretty cool stuff. So first of all, what's your yeah. just off the top of your head, um, when, you have, when you're seeing these images from the James Webb, what does that do to you? I think it's awe-inspiring uh, to see all these, these wonders that have been there this whole time, and we're just now getting the capability of perceiving them and just perceiving God's glory through them. Uh, a universe of wonders <laughs> surrounds yeah. us. Yeah. And we're just getting a tiny glimpse of that. And so real quickly, um, tell us the James Webb compared to the Hubble, both in space, space telescopes, but two different technologies, right? So run through what, what the differences are and why is the James Webb so much better? Hubble is designed primarily to be an optical telescope and getting uh, collecting light in the visible spectrum, the wavelengths of light that our eyes are capable of perceiving. So it's essentially a... a a telescope hooked up, a really good telescope hooked up to a really good camera, in a sense. James Webb, of course, is uh, several decades later, technology's gotten better, so we can have more miniaturized electronics pack more into an available space, so to speak. But it's also des- it's designed for a different purpose. It's designed primarily to look into the infrared, the wavelengths beyond red that our eyes are incapable of seeing, okay. you know, like through a telescope or such. And that allows us to look deeper or more deeply into space. Because as we look farther and farther out, objects are more red shifted, meaning their their light is stretched out, if you will. And when that stretching gets to a certain point, uh, our eyes can no longer perceive those wavelengths anymore. The colors go, you know, below red, if you will, to a place that our eyes couldn't normally see. So James Webb is designed to look at things and measure things that our previous um, telescopes weren't really meant to do. I mean, there's there's other telescopes that can perceive in the infrared, but James Webb is designed specifically for this purpose. And so for that reason, it can see things farther and farther out than we had the capability of seeing before hmm. and at a higher resolution. All right. So when, when you're looking further back, you know, according to the evolutionary model uh, or the Big Bang model of cosmology, mm-hmm. uh, the further you look back is the, the, the younger, they would say, you're, you're, you're looking or the earlier that you're looking in the, earlier, the supposed yeah, formation of, of these stars, galaxies, and so on and so forth. Right. So there's, there's two things that we probably want to talk about. One is the supposed reaction from these Big Bang cosmologists and also to, to the James Webb imagery. 
And also some of the objects that, that they're seeing in more detail or further back are different than what the model predicted, which yes. that to me is, it, it kind of would fit with what you were thinking, you know, if we were younger and God created these things, you would expect it to be, you know, full immature spirals or whatever it is. So maybe go through the, the second question first. We started to see the James Webb research coming in and the pictures coming in. Did it fit the Big Bang cosmology? Did it fit their predictions or did it fit kind of the, the creation uh, predictions of what you would expect to find? I want to define our terms a little bit first. Okay. Um, the Big Bang cosmology, Big Bang cosmogony specifically, cosmogony means history of the universe, uh, the Big Bang model claims to explain where the universe came from, but it's only focused on the very beginning of the universe's history. There's a singularity. Uh, the universe leapt into existence, if you will. It expanded. Energy cooled into matter. Matter condensed into objects. So the Big Bang supposedly uh, explains. Uh, I don't, of course, full disclosure, I don't accept the Big Bang model. Uh, there's good reasons not to. But Taking it from their perspective, they believe the Big Bang explains where the universe came from. Subsequent development within the universe, strictly speaking, isn't really part of the Big Bang model itself. So the things we'll be talking about um, in our discussion are with are within a Big Bang context. Uh, so people who accept the Big Big Bang model then develop models for later in the universe's history. Maybe that's too fine of a point, but I want to make you know want to clarify a little bit. Sure. Um, the, the stuff we're talking about doesn't confirm or falsify the Big Bang model specifically, but it does cast doubt on the overall context. So I just wanted to say And that. the reason is because the Big Bang was the origin of, of matter, but then it would have been a long epoch of time, right? Before right. everything that we see would have formed according to that theory. Right. Okay. Correct. So then a little bit of context as to how and what we're observing here. Um, the key thing we'll be talking about in this discussion is galaxies. Okay. And in case people aren't familiar with this, so a galaxy is just a collection of stars and dust and gas, uh, a typical galaxy and 100 to 200 billion stars in it. And galaxies come in various shapes and structures and sizes. And we're in one. Uh, um, you we're can in see one, it. the, yeah, the you Milky Way it. galaxy. Right, yes. Milky Way, and it's a spiral bar galaxy? Thought to be a barred spiral, okay. yes. It's difficult to tell for sure because we're in the inside of it. <laughs> But were we on the outside looking at it, huh. then the current thinking is we would see a barred spiral. Okay. The main point of discussion here is galaxies outside of our own uh, and far and far away. We've had the capability of observing galaxies for you know quite some time now. Uh, although the existence of galaxies as separate objects outside of the Milky Way is actually a fairly new development uh, in astronomical terms. It's actually been less than 100 years since it be became widely accepted that these objects are not just gas clouds within the Milky Way, they're actually collections of stars outside of the Milky Way. So a lot of people don't realize that. But as we've been observing these, there's different sizes and structures and shapes, and astronomers have categorized these into categories. Uh, irregulars, ellipticals, and spirals are the primary things that we'll be talking about here. Now, coming at this from an evolutionary perspective, which is where the secular astronomers are coming from, of course, they believe that the universe came into existence and then all these objects formed on their own without a creator or designer being involved. So they have had to try to come up with some possible evolutionary sequence of what formed first and then what formed later from the first stages and so on. And the current thinking now is that you had irregulars forming first and an irregular galaxy, as the name implies, it's not a structured uh, collection of stars. It's just kind of a blob. It's They're typically asymmetric, you know, just blobs, <laughs> if you will. And then the irregulars gathered themselves together over time and combined into disks, of, of which spirals are a, a subcategory. Okay, let me ask a quick question at this point, because then if that's the thinking, then the further back you look, the more irregulars you would have expect to find. Is that an accurate assumption? Right. Okay. As you look farther and farther out, if you're truly looking back in time, mm -hmm. as the Big Bang context would uh, would say, mm -hmm. then you should eventually reach a point where the universe is dominated by irregular galaxies. Because if you can, if you could look far enough back in time, and we'll talk about that if in just a moment, 
then you would be seeing mature galaxies. And then as you look farther and farther out, mature, mature, and then you'll start to see immature of which the irregulars and the quote unquote peculiars should be the dominant form because those are supposedly the ones that formed first. Now, a creation perspective wouldn't predict this. If, if we believe that God formed a universe fully formed and functional, then we wouldn't expect to see various evolutionary stages of these things gathering themselves together and forming all these structures. We would expect to see mature galaxies all the way out. Got it. So that, that's the context. And with Hubble and some uh, of the better ground observatories, we've, been, we've had the capability of looking fairly deep into space uh, for a couple of decades now. And interesting, if you look at the context of this, up until the early to mid-2000s, the, the modelers of galaxy formation had understood that a galaxy should need three to six billion years to form. Now, the universe is supposed to be almost 14 billion. We'll, we'll call it 14 just to make the numbers easy. Um, so if it took a galaxy three to six billion to form, well, let's say three to be generous to them, they could form quickly then if we could look more than 11 billion light years of what's called look-back time out, then we would be seeing the first 3 billion years of the universe, and we should start to see this epoch, this era, that was dominated by the immature galaxies that were just starting to form. Okay, so how far back um, does the web allow us to look in light years? I want to make a distinction. There's there's distance and then there's look back time. Okay. And those, um, so let's so, call it look so back time. Yeah, that, that's what we'll be talking in context okay. of. So we, we can see the equivalent with James Webb of over 13 and a half billion wow. light years wow. away okay. of look back time. Okay. So we are well within that margin of time mm-hmm. after the big supposed Big Bang when galaxies were supposed to be forming. Now, James Webb wasn't even the first one the first telescope that uh, allowed us to push back fairly distant into the past, if you will, uh, Hubble and some ground observatories were already able to look fairly back, um, fairly deep into the universe, which according to Big Bang interpretation would be back into history. And already in the early 2000s, it was understood that there's mature galaxies farther and farther back in time when there shouldn't be any yet, according to their way of thinking. And this was already, you know, causing a lot of people to scratch their heads, even like 2004, 2005, uh, where looking farther and farther back, there's all these things that shouldn't be there yet, but there they are. James Webb has allowed us to push back even farther, and it's actually causing two different challenges to a secular interpretation of the universe. The first is that we're, we, we can look reliably more deeply into space than we could before, And so we're able to look back into a window of time, so to speak, that was inaccessible to us before. And we're seeing things that we're seeing mature galaxies back then. And we're also uh, able to look and get better images of regions that Hubble and other observatories had previously looked at and found out that what had been thought to be an era fairly dominated by irregulars. Actually, there's a lot of disk galaxies there that weren't previously visible because, you know, that was at the limits of observability for that particular equipment. Got it. Got so it. on the one hand, it's it's taking images that had been claimed to support the claims of galaxy evolution because, oh, look, you know, when we, when we look as far back as we can, we're seeing these immature galaxies. James Webb is getting better images of those same regions and saying, wait a minute, there's a lot of disk galaxies there that we couldn't see before. And for that matter, some of the galaxies that we thought were irregular actually are disks now that we can see them more clearly. So on the one hand, it's removing support for the idea of galactic evolution in the regions that we already saw. And as we push farther and farther back, we're still seeing mature galaxies. Okay. So that's where there shouldn't be any. To kind of make it real simple, the further we look back, the more we're seeing what they would call mature galaxies or disk yes. or spiral. They're, they're formed, not just kind of your blob, but they've got a, a, a symmetry to them. And the further we're right. looking back and the more uh, defined we're looking at areas we've already looked at, it's not lining up with their theory in a, in a, major, Correct. a major way. Yes. Okay. So what are, what are they saying about this then? Are they worried? And I've, I've seen some quotes in the secular media that you know they're worried they have to rethink things obviously they're they're not going to throw away their evolutionary thinking um they should but they're not going to so what what is the reaction 
to all of this? The reaction is that the currently understood models of galaxy formation are clearly wrong. James Webb is able to look from a Big Bang context back to less than 250 million years after the Big Bang. So 250 million is one quarter of one billion. So galaxies are supposed to need three to six billion years to form. We're looking back to one quarter of one billion, and we're seeing fully functional mature galaxies. And not only that, there's an additional challenge here too, because these are mature galaxies containing stars with heavier elements than what would have been anticipated also. The Big Bang allegedly, had it happened, uh, could only form a few elements, hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, maybe a little beryllium, and that's it. Of course, the universe contains a lot more elements than that. I mean, we're made of oxygen, carbon, and a bunch of other elements. So from a Big Bang perspective, the first stars could only have formed from basically hydrogen and helium because that's all that existed initially. That's all the Big Bang could have made. Then stars had to burn and through fusion create different elements, transmute them, and then explode and spread these elements through the universe. So other stars forming later could then incorporate these new elements. My, my point is that if we were seeing the very first galaxies, then we would be seeing the very first generation of stars, which could only be made of hydrogen and helium. But that's not what we're seeing. Hmm. These stars contain heavier elements like oxygen, for example. That means not only are we seeing galaxies that shouldn't exist yet, they had to form even farther back in time from a Big Bang context than even the James Webb is able to perceive. So it's not only that we're seeing mature galaxies back when there shouldn't have been any yet. These galaxies are composed of stars that aren't the first generation of stars either. The, the fact that these stars contain heavier elements means that these are at least a second or a third generation star pushing their apparent origin back even farther in time. And from a Big Bang context, from the secular way of looking at things, you're already, I mean, a quarter of a billion years, like I said, is only a small fraction of the time necessary to form these things in the first place. But the actual formation time itself must have been even farther back in time than that. And the available window of time that they have to, for these things to form it has been shrinking steadily. And James Webb has pushed it you know, back to here. Right. It's already far smaller than it was supposed to have been. Let's say you were, uh, years ago, you believed in, in these, um, these theories. What would you be doing at this point if you were, before you knew everything you know about um, creation and the Bible and God, where would you be when you're seeing all of this contradiction with the web? imagery? Well, my reaction probably would be similar to what most secular cosmologists are doing today, and that's to say, well, apparently galaxies must be able to form much more quickly than we thought. It's very unusual for anybody to question the overall Big Bang context, because that's the dominant paradigm within secular astronomy and cosmology today. So if you've been taught to think in a certain way, you're not going to think outside of, of that box, if you will. You're going to try to reinterpret new data in the same context that you've previously held. So what are some of the things that you've read about uh, people are saying, um, like what you just said, that, that maybe we were wrong, but not that the Big Bang didn't happen, but we were wrong in that, you know, we assumed that this could only form at this amount of time. So what have you been hearing or reading in the headlines from secular scientists? Mostly it's been just expressions of, well, apparently we were wrong on formation times. Uh, there haven't yet been a lot of significant proposals for how you could speed that process up just because there hasn't been enough time. I mean, James Webb just, you know, just really became active early in the summer. So it's only been a few months since the new data has been, is being published and people are starting to grapple with the implications of all this. But even before James Webb was launched, now this is just personal speculation on my part, I've been wondering if the overall time scale of the Big Bang itself will be adjusted. Because even before James Webb, it was we were already below that window of three to six billion years available for galaxies to form. Even Hubble had had you know had pushed that window down further than it was supposed to be able be able to go. So even though the claims are that the Big Bang, the age of, uh, of the universe according to the Big Bang model is a precise, well known number, I've privately sort of been expecting that number to be adjusted upwards just to give them more time because they need it. Isn't that usually what happens, though, even with uh, biological evolution? 
um, boy, it just this can't have happened in the amount of time that has been allotted, which is a lot of time. So let's just add more time. That's really sure. the only thing they have. Actually, I mean, yeah, that's a good analogy because a lot of times they'll say, well, this animal pops into the fossil record at age X. And so therefore it needed all this time to evolve. And then they'll, then they'll find another specimen of that farther down in the layers where none had been known before. And so that then shrinks their available time to produce it. So yeah, there's a correspondence there. All right. So when, when you're getting to see all of these images of the galaxies and the uh, nebula and all of that, like, doesn't it just kind of reaffirm the greatness of God and, and how he isn't just a God of order and precision, but he's also a God that must love beauty and, and color and mm-hmm. art? Yes. Yeah, I'm art beyond our capability to produce or comprehend, really, in many ways. Just the, the variety of, of things that we see and the structure and the scale the majesty, the power required to bring it all into existence, the creativity, as you just said, yeah, all of it. And only us in our modern era have been able to enjoy some of these things that have been out there the whole time. Right. So I think we're fortunate. Even things in our own solar system. I mean, Pluto was, wasn't discovered till the 20th century. Yeah. It's been there for 6,000 years with all of the interesting th- features it had and challenges for secular models that it produced. Uh, but no one even knew it until not that long ago. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Anything else you want to add about any of this? Well, it's just exciting. I mean, we're only a few months into the data coming out of the James Webb. And I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope has already had a lifetime far beyond its initial um, design expectations. So if the James Webb does something similar, we'll be enjoying stuff like this for years and years and years. It's great. Yeah. And then you've written an article on uh, your website. Let me just click on that. Your website is creationastronomy.com. Everyone needs to go in and read this. And the article is called The James Webb Space Telescope, First Discoveries and Their Implications. Yes. Very well done. If you go to creation. Pictures. Thank you. Yeah, if you go to creationastronomy.com, there's a link on top that says articles. And uh, the James Webb article is currently the top one on the list. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Spike. It's good to have you back on in Grace. And uh, thanks for having can't me. Wait on. to see what else is out there, and we can get back and, and talk about it some more. Sure. Looking forward to it. All right. Take care. Thanks. Hey, I hope you enjoyed our program on YouTube. We want to continue to provide you some great videos on God, the Bible, and how it all connects with our world. It would really help us if you would consider subscribing to the Ingrace YouTube channel. We would also like to have you comment. We will try to read and respond to them. And we also need you to hit the notification button and like the InGrace episode that you just saw. These ways will help more people hear about InGrace and more people hear the gospel of grace.